Let's make the future. Hello. 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 Yeah, wait, what? Oh, yes. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, recording is on. We can get started if you want. Welcome to Let's Make the Future, a discussion about future trends, technologies, and their implications for human society. We are coming to you from all over the world. Let's introduce ourselves. I'm Michael Curry. I was raised in Canada, and I enjoy computer programming, planning new businesses, and discussing historical events and future trends. Hello, everyone. I'm Parnian, and I'm an entrepreneur and interested in philosophy, privacy, decentralized organization, and I'm happy to talk with you. Hi, I'm Daniel Valenzuela, a mathematician and social impact enthusiast currently based in Munich. My name is Michael Oloruningo. I'm from Nigeria. I'm currently based in the Bay Area in the California. I'm interested in social entrepreneurship, uh, blockchain, and how to scale innovation and technology to the bottom 2 billion people in the world. My name is Hossein Kouhani, a tech group Kinoa from Iran, currently living in Michigan, interested in biomedical technologies, cryptocurrencies, and cosmology. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's a new one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he knows something we don't. This week's future trend discussion topic, robot spouses. One future trend that is maybe worth mentioning right now is technological unemployment when all of us may cease to be defined by our jobs in the next 10 or 20 years because there will be no jobs for humans left. And in such a world, I feel like we'll have to introduce ourselves in a different way. We can no longer identify ourselves by our jobs, but instead by our interests. And what I notice is we're already a little bit embedded in the future because most of us in our introductions introduce ourselves using our interests and not our occupations or our nationalities or anything like that. So I think that's a really positive thing. Maybe it's a sign that we're in the vanguard. Well, I can agree more with you, Michael. Actually, there is a famous book about it, like uh, right brainers. If you heard of it, like in the future, like the only people that can basically make some value and earn some living is the ones that they use the right hemisphere figuratively so that they can create content rather than crunching data that would be all done with computers in the future. All right. So with that, Haas, what is our topic today? So our topic today is robotic spouses, which can be formed either from an artificial intelligence point of view, or it could be as a robotic interface, as a physical body. All right. To get us started, I can quote from an article in Fortune by Tessa Berenson. This was published about six months ago. Humans marrying robots? Experts say it's really coming. If you were rooting for Dolores and William to make it on Westworld, just wait a few more decades and their relationship may be able to exist in real life. Because a few experts say marriage will be legal between humans and robots by 2050. At a conference last week, I guess this is in December 2016, called Love and Sex with Robots at Goldsmith University in London, David Levy, author of a book on human-robot love, made the bold prediction. And while some other experts were skeptical, many experts did support Levy's idea. That may seem outrageous because it's only 35 years away. But 35 years ago, people thought homosexual marriage was outrageous. Until the 1970s, some states didn't allow people of different races to marry each other. Society does progress and change very rapidly. And Choak pointed out that there could be some real advantages to robot relationships. A lot of human marriages are very unhappy, he said. Compared to a bad marriage, a robot will be better than a human. So what do you guys think? I could even comment about marriage. When I hear marriage, I immediately think of rights. I mean to think of economy and financial complications. So first thing comes to my mind, do robots have rights in the future? You know, I think uh, if I want to jump in is um, rights uh, come with, do, do, you, do, do you ascribe a personality to a robot and that way do they have 
their own institution can they be held responsible for you know their actions and stuff like that so you, you can't talk about rights without leaving some kind of limitations to that so if robots are going to be programmed to think in a certain way and there's going to be some measure of certainty to their behavior then you know to that point then robots cannot be held responsible you have to hold maybe the person who programmed the robot and responsible for the robot's action so it's very interesting you know to say you manage uh, with my robots but i think it's going to be possible but to what extent would define the limitations of it it will still be something that would evolve into the future so michael when you say that robots should be held responsible for their actions I wonder who it is that we're holding responsible, because if I manufacture a robot that's designed to kill people on purpose, then me, the inventor, should be held responsible, presumably. So I wonder at what point is it the robot that's being legally held responsible, and at what point is the inventor or the designer of the robot that is held responsible? Yes, I definitely agree with you on that. I mean, it's a very big gray area right now. It might be difficult for us, for me to certainly say, okay, you know, um, robots will be held accountable. But if we, to some extent, begin to program free will into computer language and how robots behave, then that will come a point where we can establish rights and responsibility. I wonder if it only makes sense to say that a robot has rights when it has responsibilities. So I like the way that you've paired the two together. It doesn't make sense to say you have rights to live in society, to vote, or to do other things, unless you also are held accountable to the laws of society. So um, it makes sense, and I suppose it does depend on our ability to program some kind of agency or free will, as you say, into these intelligences. Sure. Now, I wonder if we can pull it back, though, to robot spouses again, because in the case of a robot spouse, presumably they've been programmed to love a specific human. So I wonder about the morality of programming a robot in such a way that they're sort of tied to a given person. Like, we would think it would be terribly immoral to, you know, brainwash a woman into loving a certain man, for example. So how is it right to do that to a robot, to force them basically into a relationship that they didn't consent to? Or are we thinking that we'd have to have these robots, you know, consent to these marriages, in which case I feel like the market is going to be far less comprehensive. I want to add actually three points. The first point is regarding your discussion is that the nature of relationship, I think it's completely changed. So we're going to see more polygamous relationship compared to monogamous relationship. And then you can try many different robots, presumably. But also robots can have different majority or different personalities. So it can be one robot, but then it can be modular. So you can have like different personality of the robots with different plugins. The second point I wanted to mention about the good positive aspect, because I guess right now there's a lot of biases in human nature towards finding relationship with other people. And I think that actually can reduce that social structure because we can create the robot that really loves every human being. Doesn't matter of the race, height, or any of those biases that we currently have. And then the third point, which I think it might be dangerous, is that robots, as Michael mentioned, might have the ability of manipulation, of love someone and then the way they react and then manipulate human in many different ways. So by recognizing their behavior and then adjusting their personality and based on the feedback loop of humans, so they actually really able to manipulate us in many different ways. So that's the point to consider. I really agree with what you just said about the juxtaposition of monogamy and polygamy. It's interesting how we immediately think of having one single partner when we think of a robot, which honestly, it's a bias we all have. Like, why would we have just one spouse if they could be robots? We could have a multiple variety of various robots for different applications, just as we have a lot of different applications on our phones. Exactly. Yeah, I suppose one of the most compelling things about dating robots is that they don't complain when you do bad things to them, right? So you could cheat on your robot spouse and (laughs) there's no attendant moral consequence or, you know, you're not doing anything wrong if the robot doesn't care, right? If you've programmed it not to care. If the program is 
future, then they have much better ability to manipulate us because they know about all our personality traits and behavior and everything. So they really easy they can also like react or communicate with us in a way that they convince us in many different ways. Well, this is really fascinating what you're saying, Parney, there. But first, Daniel, why don't you comment? I was just wondering, right now we are already talking about specifics, but can we first take it a step back and really ask ourselves what a spouse or for a robot to be a spouse, what does that mean? Is that possible in which ways, like properties of a spouse that a robot would need to fulfill, for example? Because what you're saying about like having multiple spouses or like having a robot as a spouse that does not want to cheat kind of implies that the robot doesn't care about you. For example, I feel like there's a lot of one of the first things of when I think about partnerships is mutuality, meaning that it would not be enough for you to love the robot, but also for the robot to love you, for example. And so that's something that I see critical. And I'm really wondering what you guys are thinking are the most important traits of a spouse that will be need to focus. I totally agree with what you just said that honestly, sometimes we want our partners to be jealous. And that's an indication of how much they care about us. So that would be a definitive difference difference between a friends for benefit and a married couple. A robot for benefits. Interesting. Yeah, I feel like a robot does need to, you need to feel like the robot loves you to have a compelling experience. That's a good point. And to experience that love, you may need to see the robot act jealous, etc. But I do want to point out that I think we overestimate our complexity in thinking that the robot will need to be super complicated in order to convince a human that, you know, it loves it. I feel like we fall in love or we believe that like our dog loves us or our cat loves us. And I'm sure that they do. But they're far less cognitively complicated than a human is. So it shouldn't be too hard to program a robot with the traits that are needed to convince a human that it is that the human is being loved. I feel like that will be a rather trivial thing to do. But what I do find scary, though, is this manipulation thing that Parney raised that I hadn't even thought of. When I first thought about robot spouses, I was thinking it was sort of like those internet dating sites where you pick a set of personality traits that you're interested in, and then you go online and you look through various human profiles to try to find a match with your interests and traits. But of course, there's a finite number of humans, and they all have their own interests that may not match up with yours. So it seemed to me like it was great to just, you could just design a robot with the interests that you're interested in. So maybe you want a robot, Haas, for example, interested in cosmology, since that's your new interest there. But now I'm realizing that I think Parney has a far more powerful mechanism to create attraction between the robot and the human. And that's basically a kind of machine learning feedback loop where the robot observes the human and takes advantage probably of like vast amounts of data collected from other robot relationships and is able to like latch on to all the different psychological quirks that it's observing in the human and manipulate the human into falling madly in love with that robot. Now, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but I'm just saying that we may be able to very easily program a robot to make us fall madly in love with it. Yes, and also the other things I'm thinking about is if an idea is it's Tinder for pretty much robots or you can find different applications or different personality of the robots and then you can try and see which type of personality you actually really like and enjoy. And that might be really work for the real also relationship because if you know what type of personality you're more comfortable with, then you can find actually the person that you're comfortable with human-wise too, which I guess that's interesting aspect to look at too. So the robot becomes training for human relationships? It can be at some point. So you can learn about like what type of personality or diversity or things that you enjoy. And then based on that, they can actually improve in some sense, some, some sense human relationships because then I know exactly what type of person I really like to be with. And if you have the data of all humans, they can directly point me to those type of people, which I'm really interested in. Because I guess the problem with current marriage is that lots of people, they don't find or they don't see the person that they necessarily like or want to be with. Just to add to that, I kind of like uh, like the idea of robots collecting data from human beings and adjusting behavior to it. So, which means that humans are more slower to responding to 
new information, but where the robot can easily be able to collect data from the spouse or the multiple other relationships and be able to respond better. So it's kind of like who's very, very interesting. It could be, it could be transformational in a way, but it might also be a long way from getting the intangible, the practicality of it. But if robots are able to respond to human behavior, you know, pretty much faster, then that could be a very big opportunity in that space. What do you think is the consequence to human reproduction if these robots are so seductive and able to draw from best practices analyzed uh, through the analysis of millions and millions of relationships? I wonder if we're going to have a problem when these robots are out competing humans and no human will want to be in a relationship with another human and so we will cease to reproduce or will there be some other mechanism that I'm not seeing? I, mean, I guess yeah. Michael... Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Go so I guess in a world that robots can be as advanced as to be spouses for humans, I think by the time we will have out-of-body human birth, so we actually don't really need a one-on-one -on -one relationship to create humans. Exactly. That's probably what <laughs> all of us three starting at the same time talking wanted to say. And um, also, I feel like this is totally in the same flavor of what we're talking about, because with these robot spouses, what we're getting at or the direction we're getting to is basically us being in the driver's seat or being able to better like control everything basically you want from the relationship because it will learn and you will have robots that will be perfectly suited for you and so it also makes sense to basically be the master or the decider of when and what kind of baby you want to get the question is in terms of for example what biologically happens with reproduction is that you take basically two different i don't know probably i'm totally wrong here in biological terms but two DNAs or two basically identifiers from people and something new gets out of this and the question is how will that or what are the two sources for the child that totally be programmable for your child from you. Daniel revealing he's not a biologist. I'm also really sick today so so probably my thoughts don't already make sense but yeah. No, no, it's perfect. I, I can't really explain how <laughs> reproduction works either <laughs> at the molecular level, but uh, it's yeah, just exactly like you said, combination of, of two humans. So I guess uh, one aspect that we are so far missing a lot from this topic is that in a relationship, what is really key is attention. So what is attention is basically a highway, a transaction between creating value and seeking value. So when we think of a partner, no matter if it's the robot side or it's a human side, we want a mutual relationship based on value. So for example, aside from just seeking value from the human side, so yes, we want a lot of things, we want services, we want humor, we want beauty, we want so many aspects that we might be able to more or less fetch and get from a robot. But giving and receiving are both important in a relationship. So here's the next question. What is it that robots could really want from us? What is it that, because it's important to be in a relationship that we feel valuable. It's like we feel useful. We feel we are wanted. So how's that part is going to be looking like in the future? How's that robot? What is it that a robot really wants that we can provide and compete with other partners and to provide for that robot? So the, it goes back to what Michael was saying. Like, how is it that a robot can fall in love? Ex how can we really program a robot that way? So I was thinking about the exact same thing when we were earlier talking about how to fall in love with a robot. And I feel like I couldn't agree more with what was said earlier earlier that that's easy or that's like psychologically the mind of human is not that hard to like convince or seduce and we discussed this in the context of having constant improvement of the robot and I feel like part of this constant improvement using data will probably be making you feel valuable and then the question is so attention what you're talking about I feel like is basically an effect of intrinsic interest into the other person and what I feel like a robot can do is pretend to be interested in that person and also give them attention as an effect of that. But the question will be if you as a person can decide or distinguish or how much it matters to you if the other party just pretends to be interested and you don't will not really notice it, that they're not intrinsically interested or they really need to be intrinsically interested. Maybe I'm also thinking too short term here. What do you think? Well, Daniel, one aspect of relationships that, of course, causes a lot of pain and frustration is infidelity. And 
And with a robot, you have a guarantee that they will not cheat on you because they, you know, I don't know, they're locked in your house or you have a geo tracker on them or whatever, right? So I feel like that's something that will be a good thing to keep you bonded to that robot. But also, I completely agree with you that in order to feel like the robot cares about you or to feel like the robot is seeking value in you also, as Haas says, the robot will be able to fake that signal rather well. Yeah. So I see two problems here. First, Daniel said a robot that pretends to pay attention to us, pretends that cares about us. So is this really valuable? And second, Michael, you said infidelity is a problem so that if a robot is programmed not to be able to be infidel, then we are happy. I don't think that's the case. I think the reason we appreciate loyalty is that that person is able to be infidel. So when they're not, then we appreciate it. But if somebody is not able to be infidel, if it's only programmed to be loyal, are we really interested in that? Do we really enjoy that? Okay, I think you're making a really interesting point in that I wonder if you know, for example, we started in the 1950s with Playboy magazine, right? And there were images of, you know, women in bikinis or something. And progressively from that decade on, we got more and more advanced, detailed, visceral human pornography. And all the way up to the latest day when, you know, you have virtual reality systems that can show you in three dimensions a woman in front of you in various sexual positions, right? So we can imagine that technology getting better and better to the point where there's even a robot that's capable, like a sex bot, that's capable of performing the reproductive act with you in full, you know, just as accurately as an actual human would be able to do. But I think the point that you're raising here is that in all those cases, because there was never any competition there, there was never any struggle to obtain this person, and you're just automatically getting them because you're buying the magazine or you're purchasing the robot or whatever, it never quite feels like a reproductive conquest. It doesn't really get into our brain like a real relationship. So I wonder if unless you're really fighting for this robot or fighting for this relationship, it's always going to feel like masturbation. But I want to add something also that one of the, again, positive aspects of having robots is that the limitation right now we do have, like, for example, for the people they want to explore cosmos and going to Mars and different planets, one of the hard implications is that we are far from our families. And that's why it's like emotional support that lots of humans need. It's getting out from them. But imagine if you're the robots that have data from lots and lots and volumes of humans, then you have infinite time to be entertained and fall in love with different people or even one person in like a space travels or different places, which right now is makes it really, really hard because our love or social groups are based in us. So it makes us really hard to separate from them. So I guess that's also the other aspect to consider. So Parney, do you think robots will start to date other robots and be fully bored of humans? Not other robots, no, but one thing I'm talking about that when we are traveling to other planets, one of the hardest part for an astronomer is that they are very far from their families and it's really hard to connect with the, they are far from their family and social groups, like for example, astronaut, like the person is going to a space is like, they don't have like their social groups, so it's much better for them if they actually build a relationship with robots in the space trip. So they can have the data that robots can contain the data of like so many different humans and they actually can build lots of relationship with many different people virtually, not with the real human, but with other robots that are getting the data from humans. So they can actually think that they are living in the earth. They can build friendship and marriage and many different things with the simulated robot that have the data and personality about different humans. I think the point that Tanya raised is very, very valid in terms of even the in space, far away from the family, they can cultivate the relationship with the robot, and that's fine. But also, I think uh, maybe we might also be underestimating, you know, the complexity of the event psychology and the way our needs evolve over time and what we mean and what, how would you define what value is to us? You know, like, I think there are also that we might be defining a robotic spouse more like a caregiver 
caregiver, you know, because if it's a caregiver, it's programmed to tend that to somebody's handicap or to tend that to somebody in a certain way. Maybe that might serve but to evolve into the full potential of what a spouse is might be maybe difficult to imagine because you talk about a robot having free will to be disloyal or to cheat or to do something else and how they exactly you know that has meaning in a relationship is to realize that this person whom you love is making a sacrifice for you and then you also want to give back you know like you know Osman you know uh, alluded to earlier so okay, how do you you want to ensure that you also have the value to this person you know you go out of your way you know as a guy you know one of the things that makes you feel good in a relationship is for you to be able to give something of value to your spouse and I think it's also the same for a female in a relationship as well you want to be able to give something to your spouse and that adds to the meaning and the value in that in that, in that friendship or relationship you know so it might be potentially complex but if we imagine a robot turning to a human being in a certain more definitive needs in, that would be I mean maybe possible more visible but in the total complexity of it you know what makes us part and different dimensions it might be harder than we than we are imagining right now those are great points yeah I guess the one of the big parameters we should also think here is scarcity versus abundance. So basically in our economies today, anything that is abundant becomes cheaper and cheaper until it gets to a level that it has no value anymore. So, and anything which is scarce, like gold and precious metals, they are only valuable because they are just scarce. They're just not so much of that. So I guess the, one of the key factors we can design robots to be valuable for people is that there should be a certain amount of randomness in the creation. So there has to be personalized factors. So let's say if a version of a robot is produced, it should be so that they cannot be another one just like a copy of it. So that's really important for them to be personalized and that could be a success factor. But I guess another thing for humans is like empathy. Empathy is so hardwired in our brains that we need it. And empathy comes from common backgrounds. Like no matter how many fancy robots you can have in your home, but they are none of them are made of flesh and blood and bones. So honestly, I think no matter how many services and fun you can get from robots, I guess at the end of the day, we humans kind of like other humans to pay attention to us and be with us. I kind of disagree because we don't know. And right now, I guess we start, for example, with Siri or other personal assistant. We try to talk with them and ask them. It's, it was really funny. The founder of X.AI was talking about building an AI assistant for answering your email. It said one of the most common things that people ask about that AI bot is whether they can ask them for a date or not. And that's a really funny aspect to look at it because we try to see our robots in some or like more humanized. They, yet they didn't have that capability, but we don't know what would be the implication or we don't know whether we actually like humans better or if we actually have robots better because it used to be like people had really negative view about online dating and they said, oh no, people should actually meet in university or different places and they have to physically meet it. But then you see lots of relationship, they actually is based on online dating. So it's not a bad thing. And before it was like really negative perspective about online dating, but I guess we are changing towards that. And that's one step of changing our mind to a more computational aspect. And I think with robots, physical robots, that might happen too. And also the last thing that I wanted to add, if we can actually, last part of our conversation, we can talk about what ideas we think and either for startup or companies like match.com, what other idea we're thinking about, like startup idea about these topics. Yeah, that's a good point, Parney. So I like your idea of having, we have this elevator pitch battle at the end, but why don't we have the elevator pitch battle relate to, this is a new demand, everybody needs to come up with a new talk, a new business idea, but everyone needs to come up with a business idea relating to robot spouses. But maybe before we do that, assuming everyone agrees with what Parney and I are saying there, is there any other final remarks about robot spouses? I think that this is robot spouses thing, and that's regarding what Haas and Parney were saying or discussing are 
are like a natural next step to many technological advancements. And one thing maybe just to like throw into the room is that tech so far like resulted a lot of like people becoming more I don't want to say lonely, but more like socially connected, socially, but eventually disconnected from like physical interactions. And I can see that tech might then also be the tool to eventually fix that. I mean, after all the services, after all the social networks and everything. Yeah, I feel like that's exactly what happened, that we are more disconnected. I mean, right now we are connecting over the Internet, although we're in different parts of the world. So that's, again, a good thing. It's come not. Do you get what I mean? I agree with you, Daniel. You're saying like out of our five sensory domains, which is sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. So hearing and vision are very advanced nowadays using technology. So monitors and microphones and speakers. But then what is isolating people is a physical interaction. Exactly. And I guess one of the big, huge advantages of a robotic spouse is the physicality that it brings to because yes, you can have a relationship like the movie Her and that can be completely virtual. That's one aspect, which is just the mental aspect. But I guess the physical aspect is also going to be blooming in the future in the tech environment. I agree. That's a very interesting point, Hoss, because I was in a philosophy conference and one of the things mentioned that our emotion it actually leads to lots of decision or action that we take. And following that, they mentioned that our physical or like our sensory in body is involved, like it's related to lots of emotion that we do have. Like, as you mentioned, vision is part of receptors that we have in our body that explain our emotion. Our hearing is part of our emotion when we hear song or when we listen uh, to some harmony and nice music or the sense of touch that we also feel action or we feel also emotional. And those are all leads to like kind of change our perspective or build our vision. So I guess one of the technology that you're not really discovered so far was the notion of sensories and like especially touch and feeling. I don't think like we have a advanced technology related sensing or feeling because the main reason because I guess the feel of sensing is very personalized and is related to each person. But it's really interesting to see that idea essentially in robots too and that would be change our like how we can design our robots they can sense and they can feel with their receptors in their physical body or how they can see so I guess there's not just knowing about your personality but also how we can design those sensors is important too yeah, that makes me think of business ideas relating to maybe just a really, not even a humanoid robot, but just a simple, maybe almost like a mouse pad surface. But like, as you touch it, it sort of responds to your stroke. So you like sort of, you know, run your fingers along it and it maybe makes sounds or it like responds in this abstract way. But like, I could feel like you might even fall in love with that. Like, I, w I wonder if humans are that simple that like just a little bit of human touch or like, you know, interaction like that might be enough to provide a lot of satisfaction considering we have cats and dogs and how much we love those animals. And, you know, people call them their fur babies. I wonder if we can simulate a little ball of fur and that might be enough, like a tribble or something. <laughs> <laughs> that is very interesting. Very interesting. Like you can, for example, touch like mouse and like similar to cat and they have like some like noise. It's like, oh, oh, it's going to be super interesting. All right. Any other last thoughts, guys? Otherwise, let's go into the elevator pitch battle. Let's go. All right. It's time for the elevator pitch battle. Each person has 30 seconds to pitch their business idea. Then there is a vote for the best idea. Let's begin. Who wants to start? I can start. Round one. Hoss. Talking about robotic spouses, I think genetic engineering would be the future of the robotic spouses. Why not creating biological creatures that we can code their genomes in order to be desirable by their future owner? Touching a real flesh and bones, which is created just for you as you demand, is going to be the future. I'm not sure I completely understand your idea, Huss. So you're coding the genome of a robot? What is that? 
How does that work? Basically, the idea is not robotic at all, not made of solid state material. What I'm proposing is that in future, we will be able to code a genome so that we can predict and control its behavior, personality, and even physical appearance so that we don't even create robots anymore. We actually are creating other biological humans that oh are desired God. by their owners and creators. Yes. That's oh, what I'm dear, dear, I see no moral problems with that whatsoever. You just genetically engineer your perfect spouse and expect them to fall in love with you. I see no problem with that. No problem, Michael. <laughs> Not to mention that they'll be zero years old initially. So yeah, I don't know, you're going to raise them as a child before you marry them. Anyway, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Uh, who wants to go next? It's going to be pedophile. <laughs> I can go next. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Round two. Parney. My idea is specifically related to, is explained for current uh, business owners um, that they're working in matching path from like eHarmony or uh, all of those. I'm thinking is actually if they can have a stationary with a physical robot and they upload the human characteristic on them and then they try to record the conversations I have humans and different personality traits and input embed those to create the physical robot that would be interesting i guess those people they can have much more progress even building the physical robot based on personality traits cool any comments about that guys all right that was a solid idea who wants to go next round three michael o so I have a slightly different approach to it. I think I would have uh, maybe like a bridge, a bridge idea to robotics spouse is that I kind of believe that we do not even understand, fully understand the human psychology or human behavior at this point to even design a spouse, you know, for human being, you know, like all the, currently all the dating, you know, applications that we have have not been able to fully customize, provide it from, uh, provide a platform to collect enough of data. So how would you suggest maybe to produce a form of sensor that collects information about someone over a period of, say, maybe three months or six months, that way you can see how the person responds to different situations, collect information about emotions and feelings, and then you can use that information to on a dating platform whereby you can customize, say, okay, you know, this is 90% your know, chance of creating or having a spouse for that person. That way, you know, it's a bridge to having a robotic spouse. I think that can be in the market like tomorrow. Nice. Any comments about that? That's a very near future idea. I see a lot of feasibility way more than other crazy ideas discussed. I didn't, like acoustically, I didn't understand it perfectly. Can you sum it up again? Maybe I could summarize if I have a better voice and see if I get it right. Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. You propose that since we have limited knowledge about the current psychology of human beings in order to make robotic spouses, what if we have a network of sensors that could collect a lot of data and analyze the psychology of humans in order to get a better understanding of what humans actually need. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Thanks, Michael. Round four. Daniel, you want to go? My idea was really related, if I understood correctly, to the idea of party. So if you're looking for your future spouse, future robot spouse, but you're still not sure which exact properties she should have, you can connect your Tinder account and basically collect data from all your right swipes so that superficially you will get an accurate description of what your dream spouse looks like and also maybe in terms of humor or whatever. One could also connect this service to um, if you have some more sensors on your head while walking around with a Google Glass to Michael O's idea where basically every time your brain would trigger and attract it every time you feel attracted to a woman the google glass will record the conversation you have with her mm-hmm. her looks and everything and out of that you will basically get your dream spouse yeah that's it if you want to measure arousal i'm not sure you want to hook that sensor up to the person's head maybe somewhere else but i also uh. want to add that this problem can solve like if you can come up with the idea, you can solve the problem of 20 million people in China that don't have any wife or different things because the shortage of women in China. So I guess that would be really interesting for lots of people in China too. 
Yeah, That's I actually point. just read the statistics that for each hundred women in China, there is 113.5 men. <laughs> So actually, one thing that's a consequence of that is that, and not to get too far into the weeds about this topic, but what it means is that the older men that still don't have wives end up going for the younger women. And the older men by that point have more money and they're more established. So they end up out competing the younger guys. But that only delays the problem, of course, because there's still the gender imbalance. And so now what we're seeing is some of these Chinese men are actually going out of the country to find their, their wives. And so it's disrupting the gender balance in Southeast Asia and also in Africa, apparently, there's also Chinese men that are going there to find their wives. So I wonder if that's uh, going to be a problem that will affect more countries than just China. Wait, but w w was that an opinion or a fact? Because you base your argument on the assumption that money would give you a competitive advantage in dating. I believe I was reading this as factual information from an article, but I admit that I don't have a source readily available for you. So you could take that as opinion or fact, <laughs> however you want to. I mean, it, it depends if it, it was an opinion then you make the assumption that money is a competitive advantage, which I probably would not totally agree with. If it's facts... If all else equal. If it's facts, all else it all might else. imply... I guess it depends on the culture. For example, in US, money is not the competitive advantages, or might be, but I feel like in Iran, for example, it's extremely important for like lots of people they marry that their husband have money. Yeah. But here I feel like it's more in connections and that with people. But I guess in Iran, it's just like really money is really important factors, which I really don't like it. Okay. We have one last business idea from myself. Round five. Michael Curry. How about a rogue startup that makes chatbots that connect to Tinder profiles? So it makes Tinder profiles with various attractive attributes, and then you start chatting with this chatbot, and it freely admits that it's not a real person. It's not one of those scams or anything. But it basically says, I am a chatbot, but I would love to talk to you more. I'm an AI that's been designed to speak very nicely to you, etc., and have your same interests. And then it links to maybe even a video chat that has an artificial intelligence there talking to you. And this can provide companionship to lonely Tinder users that can't get matches. So I wonder if this would satisfy the, well, help to satisfy the Chinese gender imbalance problem, as well as sort of connect to a few of the other ideas people have. I like your idea, but I think the application would be a little bit bending from what you propose. I guess the better application would be, because the reason I say that is I don't think anyone goes to Tinder in order to end up partnering with a robot. They go to Tinder to actually find partners. So I guess as a temporary solution to keep them entertained and like just to make the interface of Tinder fancier in order for people not to get bored and having more multimedia interaction with the program, I guess it's a great idea, but I don't think people would want to suffice to that robot. They, they want more, I think. Well, they'd want more. I'm saying we target the bottom end of the users that can't get dates. <laughs> the, the problem <laughs> and we that? say, look, yeah. Never give up. I mean, yeah, I mean the, <laughs> the thing is, the problem is that you try to combine multiple things. I feel like if your main idea was to help these people, it would probably be better to do the same thing, but with a human on the other end. That's too expensive. The ugliest Tinder users get paired up with this chatbot, and it's cheap, and it gives them a little bit of companionship. Or, anyway. And that's, that's a very good business idea, because you can have subscription to reach out uh, support. Uh, spot. And, and, and we can use your machine learning algorithms, Parney, your insidious algorithms to make our hapless, ugly individuals be completely in love. And so can you imagine the money-making opportunity when a human is in love with a chatbot that you have to pay 99 cents a minute for. My God. <laughs> Michael, I guess an upgrade to your bot would be that bot could be useful to coach the people to just have a better profile, man. Like a lot of people can't just have like a single straight <laughs> picture. Like could you just make one <laughs> correct picture of yourself and put it in there? They just can't do it. T Tinder coach on Tinder. <laughs> Tinder, like, it's, it, you match with this person, they're like, look, I'm not a real person, but I'm going to tell you, like, your profile sucks, man. Come on. Yeah. Get, yeah. And yeah. Also, yeah. 
also like the physical station that actually you can have like for example physical robots are kind of combining like the idea you can actually get to like talk with chatbot but you can actually have like physical station that you can meet those robots virtually that would be interesting too i'm thinking of also the the same thing but it would probably be more like a marketing thing have you seen this brothel of like robots dolls in barcelona that's also probably coming to the uk no Okay, so there's like yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, there's like four different types of dolls, and they can like they dress in different stuff. And you could also like have a really dirty Tinder AI, where when you get to it, it will like tell you your wildest dreams and ask you what you would like that person to wear, and then invite you to come over there. I don't know. It just suddenly makes me realize that maybe in the future we'll have robot prostitutes, where you like dial a number, and then a robot will walk to your house, and you can you can have your way with it. Um, my God. The implications. <laughs> now, let's choose a winner. Now it's time for us to vote on the best business idea. So is it number one, Haas's idea of custom human clones genetically engineered with desired traits? Is it number two, Parney's idea to load human personality traits into robots? Number three, Michael O's idea of a sensor that collects information about someone over a period of months to build a dating profile? Is it number four, Daniel's idea, if you're not sure about what future spouse you want, it connects to your Tinder account to give you and generate a dream spouse that fits your profile. Or number five, Michael's idea of a chatbot that appeals to ugly Tinder users. All right, so the way this voting works for the people who haven't done this before is on the count of three, we all say one name, either Haas, Parney, Michael O, Daniel, or Michael C, and you can't be uh, voting for yourself, and that's the only rule. So I'm going to count one, two, three, and then we're all going to say the name, okay? Okay, one, two, three, Michael, Michael O. C. Parney. Let's make a future. I guess the combination of our, our idea was great. Yeah. What was your vote, Michael O? Oh, I'll vote for Pani's idea. Okay, so now I have to tabulate this because I... Okay, so I voted for Michael O, and Haas, you voted for who? Pani. Parney. Michael O voted for Parney, and Daniel, you voted for who? You. Oh, sorry, Michael C. Okay, Michael C, and then... Uh, did I miss anybody? And then... And, oh, and then Parney voted for all of us. I... What for collective of ideas we had? You know, it's true. This was a themed business plan competition, and all of our ideas are sort of connected to one another, aren't they? But there can only be one winner, and that winner is Parney. Congratulations to Parney. Woo! Nice. Good job. <laughs> All but right, I well, really like our idea of every people. I guess it was really interesting and all connected, as I mentioned. So I don't think I'm a winner. I guess all of us is a winner and we're creating a good future. <laughs> a born politician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, future Ayatollah of Mars, that's you, Parney, for sure. It's an inside joke. Okay, Haas, do you want to say goodbye? Thank you, everyone. This was really fun. I had a great time. It was great. Have a great time, everyone. Yeah, it was a great time collecting ideas of the present and the future. So, it was great. Please, everybody, join us next time. And subscribe to our channel if you want to hear about new ideas. Okay, everybody, have a good day. Have a good night. I had a great time, guys. See you next time. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel at mixcloud.com slash make the future. Bye bye. Let's make the future. Music and editing. Christian Peltonen. Featuring the voices of Michael Curry, Hossein Kuhani, Daniel Valenzuela, Parnion Barakatane, Michael Allerunenwoe.